Welcome to Life Stories with me, Des Tong. Now, my guest this week is a musical director who recently had the honour of performing at the Queen's 90th birthday ceremonies. He actually did the arrangement for none other than Dame Shirley Bassey, Diamonds Are Forever. Welcome, Mike Alexander. Thank you. Nice to be here, Des. That must have been a bit of a buzz. Well, it, yeah, it was actually because I hadn't uh, worked with Dame Shirley for 22 years and I had a telephone call out of the blue from uh, Live Nation who said uh, Dame Shirley would like you to be involved in the Windsor celebrations for the Queen. And uh, I sort of said, great, what do I have to do? He said, well, you've got to conduct a 75-piece orchestra. I, I really thought, wonderful, <laughs> fabulous. Anyway, I agreed to do it, signed the contract, and then after that they said, actually, you can't conduct. Uh, it has to be the Queen's musical director that conducts, who was a very nice guy called uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nick Grace, who comes from West Bromwich. So we had a, an immediate connection. Uh, but I did the score for it for this 75-piece orchestra, and uh, if you watch the video on YouTube, you can see a couple of hands moving in the background right at the end of it, and that's me. Uh, but it was a great honour to do it. Fantastic. And uh, following on, I'm doing the Henley Festival as well with her. So it's a reunion, really, after so many, so yeah. many years. It was a surprise to, to get it, but um, a great honour to, to be doing it again. So life stories, let's go right back. Um, you were born in Aston. I was born in Aston in 1942, yeah. Right. Yeah. And what school did you go to? Because I notice, I want to read about you, that you went to the same school as Ozzy Osbourne. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to the same school as Ozzy. It was Prince Albert. I think it's called Prince Albert School now in Albert Road, Aston. And, uh, and from, from there to Birchfield Road School. And he went to both of those schools. And the, the reason I found that out, I only met him once, Ozzy. And I met him at Elton John's wedding. And we, <laughs> we were standing at the urinal together. And I said, hello, mate, how are you? And he said, immediately turned to me and said, where are you from? And I said, same place as you. And we had a bit of a chat while we were <laughs> doing the business. And then he was dragged away by Sharon who said, come on, I want you back now, kind of thing. But yes, I found out at, at that particular event. Wow. So that was a surprise. So when you were at school, um, where did the music come from? Well, I had a terrific education. I, you know, I started Prince Albert School at five years old, and another guy that started with me was a, was a guy called Gordon Bache, who lived just around the corner from me. And um, he had piano lessons, as I did. Well, I started piano lessons at, at, the, years of, uh, at the year of eight, and he was about the same. And he was a really talented pianist, a really talented musician. In fact, he was a very talented guy. He was into all sorts of things. He could repair watches and clocks. And he did that all through his life. Sadly, he passed away about three years ago. But he lived just around the corner. So we grew up together. Mm. So we were both pianists. We learned from one another. And he was probably the greatest inspiration to me as a youngster, was Gordon Beach. Yeah. I mean, I can remember uh, my, my dad was a pianist and, and he always wanted me to, to play piano, but the dedication wasn't there. I mean, I know we were talking before, when, when you've, we, there, was no other, there was no other distractions, was there, when, when you started? Uh, well, no, there was no television in our house. We lived in a terraced house. We didn't have television. We didn't have a telephone. Uh, we used to gather around uh, the radio at 6.30 every night and listen to Dick Barton, special agent, and that was the highlight of the day, really. Yeah. Uh, but what most households did have was a piano and my mother was very keen for me to learn and uh, sent me a, across the road to a piano teacher who used to charge two and sixpence I think for an hour's lesson and uh, spent half an hour of that wrapping me across the knuckles <laughs> and playing wrong notes. With the know. ruler. Yeah with the ruler yeah that's right <laughs> and uh, then you know every night my mother would say right piano practice do you do your hours piano practice so I'd sit there and while she was in the kitchen uh, preparing my dad's tea we had a, uh, a clock on the wall and I used to turn the clock on about 20 minutes and when it got to the hour I'd say mom I finished she'd say oh is it that time already <laughs> and then while she was still preparing the tea and when my dad got home I'd turn the clock back again you know so I'd try and get away with it but that's false economy of course all of mm, that mm. 
I did that till about the age, had lessons till about the age of 12, then wanted to go and play football with my friends, and then decided to go back to music at the age of 14, uh, which of course I'm delighted I did. Mm. Did, I mean, school, did you get any, was there any encouragement from school at that time? Not really, no, no. Schools at that time didn't really have a musical education, not like private education. Private education was so much better. Mm. Um, and I don't remember any musical things at the schools that I went to. I remember in my school music lessons were just, uh, the teacher just stuck a, a classical record on and you just sat and listened to it and, and that was it really. Yeah, that, that was about it really. Yeah. I mean, every child should have music in their lives, every child. And every school should have music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so important. Yeah. And there's so much information on the internet with regard to the benefits of that, mm. uh, that parents should read. It makes you a more rounded individual, I think, to have music in your life. So as you were, the, as you were growing up then, um, who, what was your, who did you listen to? What, what were your influences at, at that time? Um, well, uh, when I left school, I couldn't do much else really. I wanted to be a musician and that was it. So I, I, I uh, and it wasn't as though there weren't jobs around because they were in those days. You could move straight out of one job into another. And I did, maybe 14 or 15 jobs before I decided to turn professional. Um, but influences, it wasn't until I got to about 19 or 20 that I was influenced by jazz music um, and heroes. There were so many. I mean, Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, people mm. like that you'd listen mm. to and you'd try and emulate. Um, and uh, I also liked um, modern music when it came in. You know, I worked in dance halls. I worked at the Locarno in Birmingham. In fact, my, my first professional job was the Locarno at Coventry, so as you had all this 1960s music that you, yeah. you, you'd listen to and you'd have to play, so you were familiar with all of that. And my second professional job was not a million miles from here, a club called the Water Splash in Warsaw, and then the Caves Club in Warsaw, where I'd have a jazz trio and, uh, and play jazz music. That's what I really loved. Right. Um, I knew I was never going to make any money at that. But, Jazz musicians don't make no, any money. No, you know, notorious, they aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's great to play. Yeah. So that's what I'd listen to. That's the kind of thing I'd listen to. Now um, I listen to everything, really. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I ever met you was, uh, and I was looking this up, I think it was 1971. And you were playing at Barbarella's in Birmingham. <laughs> now, you know, to most people, Barbarella's was the big rock club. It was, yeah. But when you went in the door, if you turned left instead of right, yeah. there was a, like a cabaret bar, and the you had a trio in there, didn't you? The like Take Two, yeah, the Take Two, yeah. Um, Barbarella's was a great experience. Uh, Eddie Futrell was, was great for me. I, I worked for Eddie for about five years in most of his clubs. He, um, people who are listening to this in Birmingham would know he had about oh, six or seven clubs, and I worked most of them, mm. from Cedar Club, um, the um, uh, Rebecca's, Barbarella's, the Goldwyn's, lots of them. And, mm. um, Abigail's was another one. Uh, but Barbarella's was a great club. I'd play, I have a jazz trio in the Take Two lounge, um, and then I would compare the big shows in the main room. Right. And I must have introduced everybody on that stage. Uh, well, in, in, in actual fact, the, the, the reason I met you was because I was with a, a band from a group from Liverpool called The Chance, who were five singers. I remember, yeah. And we were supporting the Four Tops, and for some reason or other, we didn't have a keyboard player, and we heard you playing in the cabaret lounge. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think uh, Silver was, uh, you know, crossed hands. Yeah. And you actually finished in there, took your tie off, came in the other room, set the piano up on stage, and actually worked with us. Wow. Uh, and we did the support for the Four Tops. Okay. And that was that was the first time, you know, that was the first time I met you. Well, uh, yeah, th that was great. I used to get invited uh, on on a few occasions to do that sort of thing. Um, another famous guy from Birmingham, Mike Sheridan, always used to bring a rock and roll show to Barbara's, but he never had a piano player because he couldn't take one on the road, he couldn't take the piano on the road. So he'd say, come and do some Jerry Lee Lewis stuff with us. So I did, um, which was great to play, but used to play Havoc with my nails, so, you know, <laughs> all running up and down the keyboard. Yeah. Like that. I used to wear plasters when they were coming, you know, but yeah. it was great to do. I love that. And Barbara's was, a, was great for me because I met everybody and it was in the business at the time. All the yeah. big American acts, I'd introduce Chuck Berry on stage and the Everly Brothers and uh, Ike and Tina Turner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And now I, I can't believe that I did that, but they were there. The first, we did, I used to do a, uh, a talent show 
there. Every Tuesday we used to do it. And one of the first people that came on was Victoria Wood. Came on. Right. She was at Birmingham University and she came on and she performed two of her songs. I spoke to her in the dressing room afterwards and said, I, I can't see you being a, a singer superstar, Victoria, but your songs are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Find a publisher. Mm. But we'll leave it there okay. and we'll come back in the second half. Join us soon. Welcome back to Life Stories with me, Des Tong, and my guest, Mike Alexander. Now, just before the break, we were talking about that Birmingham institution, Barbarella's. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, after that, you, I, I, I remember seeing you on Pebble Mill. Yes. Um, uh, Barbarella's was great for, uh, from a playing point of view, but I really wanted to be a musical director. I was doing uh, shows like The Golden Shot, uh, and new faces, um, and I was just the pianist for that, and used to do the, uh, an occasional arrangement for John Patrick, who was the musical director. And I thought, oh, yeah, I want to be a musical director. And I went off to be a musical director for Carl Wayne. Do you remember right. Carl? I do, I do indeed. Who was got to be one of the best singers that this country's ever produced. And we had a great time for a couple of years. We did song festivals in in Europe, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria, and we had a terrific time. And uh, sadly, he's passed on as well. Uh, but yes, uh, during the um, 90s, uh, Pebble Mill, I did Pebble Mill. I did about four or five years on Pebble Mill, five TV shows a week, um, daily TV shows, which was terrific for me. Mm. Uh, with uh, first, The first series was a five-piece band. The second series was an eight, but the rest of the series was an eight-piece band. So that was good. And you were doing like all the arrangements for... Well, I would do them, or my uh, musical associate and keyboard player Colin Campbell would do them. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was hard going, but it was, it was such great fun. And, and great. I know you mentioned one of, the, one of the guests that you worked with on there uh, was Engelbert Humperdinck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's it, points for you to even spell his name right on your website. <laughs> but I, I remember doing a, a, a gig with uh, Engelbert at the NEC, um, which was... Uh, probably one of the most difficult that I'd ever done. Yeah. Um, it, just the sheer scale of it, yeah. it, it, was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. A really nice guy. It's a lovely guy. He was, he was a lovely guy. I, I augmented the orchestra uh, for Pebble Mill. He came in, he sang Secret Love, and uh, one other, which I can't remember. But a lovely guy. But we used to back so many artists on yeah. that. I mean, Anthony Newley came on and sang with his daughter. I mean, what a great artist he was. Great writer and performer, wonderful. Um, so there were many people, too, mm. I mean, too many, I can't even remember yeah, them yeah, all. You know. yeah. I mean, when, it's, when it turns over that quickly, uh, do, you, do you even, like you say, you can't even remember them. It's a bit like Clem Cattini was saying, you know, he used to do a three hour session, he'd probably do like six or seven songs. Yeah. He'd got no idea who they were for, no. and it was just in the door and out the door. And, uh, well, before Pelba Mill, I used to do, uh, uh, I used to work for London we Weekend Television. I used to do uh, shows like Copycats, and before that was Go For It, I did Chaz and Dave's Knees Up. Um, and things like copycats were very difficult because there were a lot of musical inserts that mm. might only be five bars of something, a whole song of something else, ten bars, fifteen bars. But we'd go into a studio in London, um, I'd sit up most of the night writing a lot of this stuff and finish perhaps at about two o'clock in the morning in um, an office in London Weekend Television, telephone for a motorcycle to take them over to a copyist because this was before computers, mm. copyist to sit up all night copying them out he'd bring them back for 10 o'clock studio session in the morning. And I remember one day, uh, during the two, three hour sessions, morning and afternoon, we did something like 90 items for television. And you record them all in the one day. Mm. And they, mm. then they play them back on the floor, you know. But 90 items, that was a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Normally, for um, a three hour session, you'd look at getting um, at least six songs in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it was financially viable, yeah, wasn't it? Absolutely, you know, yeah. When you were paying yeah. strings and. Uh, That's right, yeah. 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 Um, and you did some themes as well, didn't you? In fact, one in particular. Yeah, wrote. well, my, oh, yeah, my famous theme was uh, uh, Family Fortunes, um, which, up until when it finished recently, was still running from 1988, so about 25 years. 
Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Amazing how they, they latch onto one and just, just keep it, don't they? Well, they do. They, uh, they change the arrangement a few times. Mm. They asked me the second time would I do another arrangement, which I did. The first arrangement was a 30-piece orchestra. Second arrangement was uh, about a five-piece. Third arrangement, I said, oh, no, I can't be bothered to give it to somebody else. So somebody else did it, knowing that I'd still get the paycheck yeah, yeah. because I wrote it. Um, yeah. And then uh, two other guys came in and did another arrangement of it, of that tune, a really modern arrangement, you know. And I thought, yeah, they're up with the technology. That's really good. So I was very happy with that. I don't know whether they'll do another series and use the same tune. I don't mm. know, you know. So moving on, um, it's got to be... Uh, her her shirl, her shirliness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't hear you. Don't let her hear you call her that. Uh, yes. Um, well, it's great to be working with her. I mean, I've known Dame Shirley, Shirley, for 36 years, and uh, I started with her in 1980, and uh, then went for about six or seven years, and we had a break, and then started back again in 1990. Um, and then went again for another four or five years, and then I got the Pebble Mill job where I'm doing five TV shows a week and didn't have time to do everything, but I really wanted the television. Mm. Um, and then uh, we started to get in touch again, uh, 2000 and, uh, about 2004, 2005, and uh, we'd have dinner occasionally. We went to Elton John's wedding, and, uh, which I told you about earlier. And then this came out of the blue, this one, after all those years. She said, would you come and conduct for the Queen for me? So... But you've... You, I like... You, you say on your, your website, you've worked in pretty much every major concert hall around yeah. the world. Yeah, every major concert hall. The, the Carnegie Hall, Sydney Entertainment Centre, Royal Albert Hall half a dozen times, Concert Cabao, Amsterdam. All of them, really. I mean, it, and Carnegie Hall was special. Los Angeles, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, the Greek Theatre in Los Angeles where I probably had the most fantastic orchestra. Um, uh, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, say, in Los Angeles, we did four nights there where, where, where they had the Oscars from. And to be on a stage, any one of those stages, to walk out, mm. you know what it's like. Mm. You walk out onto any one of those stages and there's something magical about it. Yeah. You know, it's like, I can only assimilate it to walking the fairways of the Belfry and imagine <laughs> the, the golfers who I admire that have walked on there, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's fa a fantastic feeling. Yeah, but it doesn't phase you, though, does it, really? No. No, you've got a job to do. Yeah. But, you, you know. And uh, uh, an old friend of mine, um, Jerry Freeman, he, he mm. was with you at that time, Jerry wasn't he? was, yeah. Jerry and I worked 15 years with Shirley. Uh, he was a drummer, and uh, he was fantastic, Jerry. He was so reliable as a drummer. He'd do the same thing every night. It'd be great, and he'd mm. be right on tempos, which is what you rely on. You know, yeah. as a conductor, you don't want to have to worry necessarily about tempos. You leave that to the drummer. That's sure. his job. You worry about everything else. And just thinking about it, another place that we <coughs> we, we came across each other was Kings, wasn't it? Oh, Kings Club. Because <laughs> you used to you used to be resident there. Didn't well, you? well, well, I say resident. Wasn't right. I used to step in when they when yeah. they were uh, when they needed a helping hand, or if the if the pianist went off and did a cruise. And I remember doing about three months there once, which was great fun. Kings and great guys, and Jerry was there as well yeah. doing that. Yeah. Uh, Peter Biggs was the bass player. Yeah. Uh, he's sadly passed on as well. It only means Jerry left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we keep going. Yeah, the Kings, yeah. And um, that was a good club, good atmosphere. And I still see the, um, the guy who used to run it, Tony. Tony, the, the very, very tall guy. tall guy, yeah. about eight foot tall, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I still see him occasionally. Right. We, <laughs> we have a coffee. But, um, and you were telling me that um, of late, um, Gary Wilmot, you, you've been working quite a lot with Gary, haven't you? Gary's my best friend. We're great mates, and uh, we speak to one another well, every day, every couple of days. We've done about five tours together. The um, the last but one tour we did, we had a ten-piece orchestra and the London Community Gospel Choir. Uh, that was great fun. And then on the next tour, he said, "Let's do another tour." And I said, "Okay, who do you want me to book? What bass player, drummer?" He said, "No, just you and me." Oh, just the two of us, yep, okay. So we put a show together called With Compliments. That, you can see that on YouTube. Uh, and I approached uh, the cruise lines, they loved it. And we did a couple of dozen cruises together. Um, 
and a chance to see the world again. The first yeah. one we did was New Zealand. Uh, so we flew out to New Zealand, picked up a ship, there, well, we picked up a ship there which had broken down and we were stuck in Auckland for like six days and then sailed up to Honolulu What's not to love? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great love and a great life. And that, I should imagine, you know, just the two of you, that's, that's quite an interactive yeah, thing, it is. isn't it? You know? yeah. Oh, it is, yeah. There was, uh, there was comedy from both sides. I mean, Gary's the, the comedian mm. and the singer and the performer, really. I'm really just the piano player. Mm. Uh, but um, it, it gave me lots of room to experience what it was like to, to perform instead of just play on the stage, you know, mm. or just be a musical director. So I, I enjoyed that. And we still write occasionally together, you know, and, right. uh, and we still speak most days. Um, so that was great fun. Yeah. Um, now I've I considered myself to be retired until I got the telephone call uh, from Dame Shirley. I thought I'd retired, and we're going to spend the rest of my days on the golf course or riding a motorcycle, which I do. So. Fantastic. Well, Mike, it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Great to talk to you and, and to see you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, one thing, of course, I did that gig for you with the chance. Yeah. I couldn't have been very good because I never got another call. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks ever so much for coming in. You're welcome, mate. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Join me again for another one of my guests on Life Stories.